A university in Davis or at St. Louis University is different than, let's say, oh, a trade school, where one simply takes a student in raw as green grass and in four years stamps them out as yet one more future alumnus. The university should be beyond that. The university people should have a chance to examine the field more broadly. I advise students in physics, don't get out in four years, heaven's sakes. Take five. And while you're at it, take literature and art and things like that that you'll never have a chance to see before because, you know, this is your chance. Well, the same thing should be also said to university faculty. The brutal fact is you take your PhD in some area and then you're tied to the millstone for the next 12 years. A couple of postdocs, assistant professor, and then finally you make tenure. At which point, at least a glimpse of freedom is possible. And at that point, you look around and say, what we should we really be doing? Are we still having fun? And if you're having, not having fun, then go someplace where the fun exists. I talked today about, about the funnest thing I've ever done. I must admit, it's not, didn't make a lot of money, but I ended up working with the most wonderful bunch of people, a team of humanists and scientists and so on, where each person appreciated each other's expertise and valued it. And his team of approach is what a university should be, to break down the barriers between departments and get people to talk to each other. Now, having said that, I have to admit, the program at Davis is a total accident. <laughs> but we started with something which we really know a lot about, smog. <laughs> uh, we had a bad problem. Around 1970, the university had something called Project Clean Air, where they tried to get people outside the normal field to get involved in air pollution research for California. So Jeannie and I drove down to Santa Cruz to go to this thing saying, well, what can we do with our large cyclotron at Davis, which was doing wonderful work in physics, but was in danger of losing money because of the Vietnam War. And we found out that, in fact, we could do quite a bit with the cyclotron. It just that it had never been done before. And so the point was that in a situation where the situation was so desperate, the state of California was willing to, in fact, commit money to sort of a rare, unusual, and chancy operation. We could use a large nuclear facilities designed for doing basic nuclear research, in my case, nuclear astrophysics, to analyze smog. And so we gave it a try. Now, what's the advantage? If you look at all of chemistry as seen by a physicist, it's in four pieces. You know, and it turned out that I work in nuclear and atomic work, and what do you know by these things are that the energy of the X-rays and so on we work with are adequate to, in fact, penetrate objects. You have X-rays of your own hand; they pass through the hand. Well, it means then you can analyze an object without taking it apart. Well, if you go ahead and use the techniques of standard chemistry, you have to dissolve it into fluid, or you have to evaporate it, or you melt it, so like that. And the part of the material, in some cases, all the material is destroyed. So we had this situation where I could analyze a sample and save it. It would still be there. And so the point was we tried to use a technique. And we took a piece, a paper filter, and we put it in front of a cyclotron beam. Now, I, I should tell you, this same beam can drill a hole in a steel plate. Now, we want to be very delicate. What happened was, in terms of a technical term, I think Kablooey is probably the most technical term I can think. If you hit a 4 MeV million volt proton against paper, everything comes out. Electron, proton, you know, name it. It's just a complete mess. Um, but what that mess tells you is what the material is made of. In particular, X-rays. Turns out X-rays are simple physics. Take it from me. I'm a nuclear physicist. X-rays are simple. And the point is, I don't know much chemistry. I like my elements in order of atomic number. Valence, schmalence, okay. And so, proton-induced X-ray emission, the proton comes in, knocks out an electron, and it gives up X-rays. And every element has a unique X-ray. If you see that X-ray, that is the element. No ifs, ands, and buts. End of story. Well, it turned out, by using this technique, we could see roughly 90% of what was present in aerosols and soul smog in about two minutes. Now, so what? Well, so what was we became the McDonald's hamburgers of elemental analysis. We were cheap. We were also non-destructive. Maybe if somebody ch challenged us, 
here, here's the filter, you analyze it. But while you're at it, don't destroy it. So the point was we started this program and it was successful. Now the kind of spectrum we got, and this is a more modern one admittedly, this is chemistry as seen by a physicist. Sodium, magnesium, aluminum, silicon, phosphorus, sulfur, chlorine, nicely in order, all the way up to lead. So you get a whole shot of x-rays at one time. Why was that so important? Because I didn't have a clue was one in California air. We didn't really know what was out there, so therefore, let's measure it all. Sort of a physicist's point of view, based upon ignorance, of which we're, of course, very proud. So, that study was successful. And over the years, this is a study of, let's say, diesel exhaust in the city of Fresno, which is about ground zero now for stuff in California. But the point was, in the 70s, then, the program grew. We were involved in the catalytic converter, uh, lead from gasoline we took out. I wrote the law on sulfur and gasoline for California. So we had success after success, which meant we became well-funded, and at the same time, our hardware became more sophisticated. But for some reason or other, and I can't tell the exact reason, I hated seeing my air filters turn brown when I analyzed them. Now, everybody else didn't care, but it bothered me. Something was happening, and so I met the system more and more sensitive to eventually I could take a raw air filter and analyze it and could not detect it had been analyzed. So, what next? Well, it turns out, the connection was Ginny. Um, basically, what happened was, Ginny worked for this Dick Schwab historian um, in 1968 to 1970 as a French-speaking editor of the Diderot Encyclopedia, a project that was, against all odds, funded by the National Science Foundation. <laughs> so, so, Dick and Ginny and I became personal friends, hiking, canoeing, things like that. So I then learned what Dick's problems were, and he learned about my capabilities. So it was at a Christmas party, and Dick had gotten a copy of the Diderot Encyclopedia that had been pirated. Now let me tell you a secret. It was the document on display at Berkeley. This was their copy of it, and it turns out it was fake. Now, by fake I mean it had been copied in some Swiss press a few years later so perfectly you could scarcely tell it apart the original. And I said to Dick naively, well, what if you analyzed it chemically? And he said, never been done. And I said, well, look, they're both made of paper. My paper filters have dirt, which is called smog. Yours has dirt, which is called ink. Let's give it a try. So Dick said, sure, why not? So we looked for an item with no social or redeeming value. And, <laughs> and an obvious candidate came, the local California Aggie newspaper. <laughs> So anyway, we took a pair of scissors and chopped out a little piece of the newspaper, about the size of an air filter, and stuck it in front of the psychotron beam, and disaster. Because it turns out it was as interesting chemically as it was editorially. It was simply chlorine and wood. Now at this point, I want the librarians, you especially Greg, to put your hands over your ears for about 40 seconds. <laughs> Dick Schwab saved the day, my historian, but he had a book by Savary called Letters in Egypt from 1784, and with a razor blade, carefully shaved off a little piece from the bottom of 35 pages of the thing and gave it to me to analyze. So, okay, ears back, you can listen now. So I put it in the psychotron and I analyzed it. But remember, don't ever underestimate my lack of knowledge. I didn't know what I was looking at. So I got the data and I put it in the dining room table, which is where we do most of our good work at home. <laughs> And I looked at the data, and to my amazement, first of all, there were lots of metals. There was zinc and copper and lead and stuff, just in small quantities, admittedly, but lots of them. And if you looked at them, you saw the zinc would go along, and the numbers would be fairly constant, and then suddenly go up again, and fairly constant, and down again. And every element seemed to have jumps every uh, eight pages. Some of you people are smiling. Okay, I didn't know what was going on, so I called Dick and said, Dick, why are eight pages always the same? He said, oh my God, that's a signature. When they put it in those days, they put it in a great big sheet and went fold, fold, fold. So clearly our technique had separate any individual piece of paper published in France around 1780 from every other piece of paper. So at that point, we got all excited. And of course, we got excited. We talked about people and so on. So, eensy weensy problem. The average book is a little larger than this. And the psychotron operates inside a vacuum. And you're not going to put a rare book in a hard vacuum with all kinds of radiation. So if you can't take the book to the psychotron, you have to take the psychotron to the book. Where did that quote come from? Anyway, 
So the point was I went to the dean, deans are useful for something, and asked for $2,250 to take the beam out of the psychotron across into the air so we can actually analyze the page out in the natural atmosphere like this, where the beam comes through, strikes the ink, x-rays go down. Now this stuff has all been paid for by the California Air Resources Board. The beam line was paid for by the Air Resources Board. We had a lot of good money behind us, but this was so easy. And the beam went through the thing and stopped here, and here's the parchment and paper. And so far, so good. So we started doing this work, and the first thing we looked at was, of course, the Diderot Encyclopedia. And it was successful. And it was boring. So we could attack each page. So what? You know, so we started doing this work, and Vic was plowing along in the fields of academia, doing his good work and that. And meanwhile, people started to come to us with other stuff, some of which was not boring. Uh, these were a series of uh, codices from um, Mexico. And we did the Nazca burial sack and so on. So we, we were flailing around without any real focus. So we had, we had a, invented a wonderful mouse trap. We couldn't find any mice. And then along comes a librarian. Once again, Dick Schwab had a friend who was a librarian at UC Riverside. And he said, why fool around with this stuff? You know, go for the gold. Why are Gutenberg's inks so black? But other inks of the same period are more like brown. And in addition, he had, in fact, a leaf of the Gutenberg Bible at UC Riverside. Now, this leaf was not in excellent condition. This leaf had been to the wars. In fact, it had been precisely to the Napoleonic Wars. The story goes back to a scholar walking in the, in the streets of Mainz in about, I think it was 1828, noticed as a child with a textbook covered with what looked like Gothic printing. So he asked, where did you get the printing from? He says, oh, we have an old book, and we ripped the pages off to you know, cover fish or whatever I guess I mean. So they go back to his house, and there in the cloud is this big old book. It's the Gutenberg Bible of the Archbishop of Mainz, whose palace was sacked by Napoleon's troops and had disappeared from sight for about 15 to 20 years. They were using it as scrap paper. So there was a piece of it left, though. In fact, you'll see some of it recently, New Testament. So anyway, at that point, they discover that the book is picked out and goes to the German hands, and I lose track of it. But this leaf had been made available, and one of them had been sold to Riverside. And it looks like this. So anyway, this librarian loans the leaf to Dick Schwab, who drives up to Sacramento Valley with this leaf in the back of his old Volkswagen. And we come to Davis and take a look at it. Now, if you look real closely, it's been cleaned very heavily. But you see that line? That's the edge where it was wrapped on the book. And with ultraviolet, you can actually see more detail. Uh, there's a scroll here. You can't see very well from there. Uh, you know, doodles in terms of ink. There's a whale up here somewhere and so on. It's a kid's textbook, right? This ink had been cleaned up nicely, and it goes there. And so we look at it, expecting to find an ink very much like we found in the Diderot Encyclopedia. Every scientist in his life should have a moment like this. We put the page in front of the psychotron beam, and in seconds knew we had done something extraordinary. In the old days, it would take 10 or 15 minutes to see the metals. These metals just leapt out, and it was copper and lead in enormous quantities. We've never seen anything like that before. All of a sudden, we realized it's not ink, it's paint. And that was a shock to us. Now, when we analyzed the red rubrication, it was blue was copper, it was azurite, actually found where the mine was, which is actually Switzerland, found where it came from. The um, vermilion was, of course, based on mercury. We think it came from the mines of Almaden in Spain, because that was a normal source for it. But there weren't enough elements in it to trace its source exactly. Well, we were excited, and of course, the word got out, and it got out to, of all places, um, the San Francisco Chronicle. Now, Jeannie has protected me all these years against what we call visiting firemen. These are people who came who would sit down and, and talk to me for hours about things. She knew how busy I was. And if this guy named Adrian Wilson called up and said, could I talk to you about your work on the Gutenberg Bible? Well, I didn't realize that Adrian Wilson was the dean of California printers. Very well thought of, had excellent books and so on. Everybody in California knew him. Adrian comes up and says, you people are doing some neat stuff. I can help. Oh, did he help. 
first of all, he starts talking to his friends in California. All of a sudden, a cornucopia of free leaves starts to arrive at Davis for analysis of all things. And so we analyze them all. For, so his open sesame, which is what we needed. So the first analysis we did, oh, by the way, this is um, Dick Schwab, as usual, page sweater, uh, Joyce Wilson and Adrian. We actually named the facility to analyze after them the Joyce and Adrian Wilson microprobe because they're such hell. So anyway, the, um, so ba after about two years, we had analyzed a series of leaves and had the ratio of copper to lead all over the place. But in the early 1920s, with the stuff that Jenny was talking about, it was realized that Gutenberg had used multiple presses. And the idea was that between four and six presses had been running somewhat simultaneously. It wasn't quite sure how many or where they were. But the idea was there was a synchronization so if we plotted it here, you can see that these three look, these look similar, these look similar, and so on. So if something is going on, it's worthwhile, but we can go no farther. Because in fact, what we needed was an entire Gutenberg Bible. Now, west of the Mississippi, there were three. There was the Gutenberg Bible in vellum, owned by the Huntington Library, which was glorious, and which you would never be able to touch. And then by accident, the Archdiocese of Los Angeles had a beautiful library called the Doheny Library, had a single copy of volume one of the Gutenberg Bible on paper. So, with the help of that, Dick Schwab and I go down, and in my silver tongue best, talk to the librarian, we'd like to analyze your Bible. How much? All of it. <gasps> the librarian was aghast, but the rector was interested. So he worked out a way to have it. Our police department at Davis was extraordinarily healthy. Plain clothes, police cars, bomb-proof boxes, double covers, the evidence room. They were just so positive to help us do this work. So anyway, we worked out a deal with the Bible Counts to Davis in complete secrecy. And my chancellor never forgave me for realizing the Gutenberg Bible was on campus. And I didn't tell him. <laughs> but the rules of the insurance people were extremely explicit. Everything was done in secrecy. So we flipped the Bible into the laboratory at night. The people 100 feet away who were using the analysts Never knew what we were analyzing. Okay. And then for around the clock, day and night, we analyzed this thing for three days. And at the end of it, there's a Haney library. So here are the people who did it. There's the rector, Dick Schwab, George Adrian Wilson. This is the librarian, a wonderful person, things I forget. Her husband, by the way, was an engineer and really helped us design the frame which held the Bible without any strain. Because it had to be at an angle. Um, if you look at Adrian carefully, it's a pencil. If you look very carefully, it's the eraser end that's near the Bible. So there's the Doheny copy right down here. So with his team, we went ahead and did the work. And here's a picture of the Bible actually being analyzed. I, I, it reminds me of some heroin tied to railroad tracks. Because <laughs> the machine to the right, oh, sorry, back. The machine to the right, if you want to, can drill a hole in a steel plate. So we had gone to great trouble, it wouldn't happen here. And what you see is the beam line comes here, here's the protons come, pass through the page, the page is resting on white felt right there, and it's being inflected, this little thing, which also is white felt. So the book is held at an angle, and one page at a time is exposed. The x-ray goes down to the detector, and here's a laser that gives you a white spot that tells you where you're located. And so we organized this thing and started working there today. Now, Jenny probably has noticed already, look at this stuff. That's red printing. In the first few leaves of the Gutenberg Bible, they tried to actually print in color. And it was so laborious, they soon gave up on it. But the first few leaves of the he copy actually were done in red. Then Jenny throws a party. Uh, I think it was beef bourguignon we had that night. <laughs> and all the people, including the policemen and the insurance people and the workers got together in our house and we had the great, and this is the librarian, enormously relieved because in fact, we'd gotten through without ruining her Bible. And then in great secrecy, the next day the Bible was written back to Camarillo. So in a few days we had the analyses. It looked like this. This now is the Bible starting from the beginning to the end as we analyze it. Now, the single lines are all verso, because that was the easy one to analyze. If we did recto and verso both, you see the double lines here. So we did all the Bible 
in verso and parts of it in recto in verso. Now, several things are obvious. First of all, the ink tends to be in batches. We knew and suspected that to make this ink, you have to boil it down to make consistency based upon the work of Strasbourg. And so the special was he made the ink in batches and then added the pigments to it. Uh, somebody suggested that the, the cost of wood in the was so high that it probably went to the forest and did it, but I have no support on that. Um, so the ink was being made in batches. It's full of metals. But I want you to look at something in particular. Note that single day, think of here so, occurs four times. So we actually took scissors this is a day before computers. And actually cut it on a dick and I were able to rearrange it to look like this. And we call it the pole star. On that one day, they ran out of ink and went back to an old batch. And they went back to it. So we know on that day, those pages were printed. When you do that, everything else organizes itself. So now we have a situation where we know then that the Bible is being done in batches. We know which brings... And now we're starting to get to the point of press. Now, I use the word press. It's a compositional unit. Whether it was actually a you know, wine press or not, I don't know. But the people who are doing the actual type setting and so on. This was your press A, press B, press F, press D. And you start to see the organization. Now, what you see is lots of gaps, because why? This is only volume one. Volume two, we don't have. So we look for volume two. But before we did that, we compared what we'd done before with the Rahini leaves. Now, these leaves are the called, called Gabriel Well leaves. Gabriel Wells gets hold of this Bible that had been in the peasant's cottage in Mines 828, and in the early 1920s, breaks it up into individual leaves called noble fragments, and then sells them out to libraries as a single page of the Gutenberg Bible because the broken volume wasn't very worth very much and it was. So these then were set out and were then sold to libraries around the country and the world, and some of them ended up in private hands. And it's those leaves, by and large, we'd analyzed throughout California. And as you go through them, you see that, by and large, oh, I do. that's wrong. Uh, sorry, got it. Um, as you go through these leaves, you see that the they're pretty much the same value. So we know that every leaf of the Gutenberg Bible that was printed for these big things would have the same ink at the same time. What was necessary now was more Bibles. And we got the Living New Testament from Indiana University analyzed first. And then the people at Harvard suddenly realized they'd been left in the dust, came out with a beautiful two-line set along with a bunch of people. And they actually flew coach. Uh, the, the, the guy, they actually had a seat for the Gutenberg Bible beside them, they flew coach. Yale came out, they actually flew first class, almost destroyed our budget. But anyway, this is, I regret, that's Bruce Cusco, who's my key person on this work, too, and the people from um, Harvard and Adrian. So the point was, now we had both volumes to work from. And now we can take and put together the entire item. This is how Gutenberg did his printing. Four, six presses, and you can see, now you see the presses come in later. This is Fuss's money. Gutenberg had to go back to the well, get additional money to finish the program. He was such a perfectionist, he was falling behind. And we know now from the letters that all the Bibles have been spoken from. They had upped the press run, and they still hadn't finished it, and they hadn't gotten paid. And things were getting nasty. So anyway, the point was, if you look carefully, you'll see these little slash marks are all from volume two. And these are all from the Bible that have been found in the back of the Peasant's Cottage. It's the only three leaves we had. And it's a very special leaf among us. That's the St. Louis University leaf. 491. <laughs> we think that this press was probably supposed to be down here on press F, but they got a slow start. So they stopped this one and jumped this from 284 up to here to finish it up. So we know that roughly within a few, probably months of 1455, when that was actually done. Um, we've analyzed the leaf and we're providing St. Louis University with actually the composition of the leaf. Um, now, about the leaf, how did we ever get it? Well, about 1985, the University of Colorado was going to add the two millionth volume to the library. And they asked me to come to their commencement ceremony and give a lecture on the leaf. They, they had bought a leaf of the Gutenberg Bible as their two millionth volume. 
At that time, I learned there were three out there, there were, and they had bought one of them. Well, one of them I knew belonged to a friend of mine in San Francisco, Bernie Rosenthal, book dealer. So I came back to Jenny and said, you know, we ought to have the University of California buy a leaf because of all the work we're doing. And she said, well, why don't we buy it? It never occurred to me in fact that we should buy a leaf. So with fear and trembling, I called up Bernie Rosenthal, and he offers a leaf to us at a price well below what he turned down from the University of Colorado. So the leaf comes up as our 20th anniversary present. And because we have it, we then start a series of studies on this leaf about how much carbon is actually in Gutenberg's ink. And with a series of rather delicate measurements, we found the number was almost none. Ink is pure paint. The only carbon in it was associated with what looks like linseed oil or some other animal oil that had been that had cooked down. So Gutenberg was printing in paint. So the genius of Gutenberg, Jenny's told you about it already. Um, obviously, they all work together. You don't put the money into a complex and beautiful typeface. Remember, Jenny, how many, was it 200 and something different pieces of type in the Gutenberg Bible? 280. 280. We, we work with lower cap, upper cap, rule 52, maybe. He had 280. An A followed by a M, an A followed by an O, or I's. So there were like 14 different kinds of I. It was a it was a beautiful piece of work. The paper was gorgeous, the ink was black, the red was red, the blue was blue. It was going to stay that way virtually forever. Uh, it's perfection. Just a gorgeous piece of work. I mean, the idea that, let's say, the first automobile ever made in 1902 was, let's say, a Mercedes Benz 300 SL or something like that, is equally, to have the first book ever made be so beautiful. But is it actually the first book? Uh -huh. um, we also did other things, too, as part of the program. Um, this Bible belonged to Johann Sebastian Bach, and there were some comments in it that are clearly Bach's thing. Other kinds, a double underline, that sheep may safely graze, underline, underline. Was it Bach's own writing or somebody else? It turns out that Bruce Kuzco found it's all by Sebastian Bach. You can see his inspiration come as he read the Bible very closely. Um, this has been the map. Um, very controversial. We analyzed it for Yale University. I had dark hair then. <laughs> Alan Pooley from Yale. Um, you notice, by the way, I'm using my fingers. We found out that we had less contamination over to the side was a little bottle of ethyl alcohol. And we found that by every five samples to wash your hands and do it, we had less contamination than with gloves. And so we actually tested to find which was worse. But we also were able to have to position it very carefully. Um, according to July 2009, Probably authentic. It goes back and forth, you know. Beautiful book. The covers were real. The insides were complete fake. <laughs> One of the things you've ever run, somebody got to great efforts to make this beautiful fake. Any students here? For your midterm exam, what is this? That's the Dead Sea Scrolls. So it turned out that what happened was the Dead Sea Scrolls of Jerusalem uh, in the shrine of the book, were turning brown. So brown, in fact, you really couldn't read some of the writing anymore. So Megan Broshi goes to Caltech saying, what is turning our stuff brown? And Caltech says, well, you ought to go to Davis. And so Mrs. Stephen Bechtel, yes, the Bechtel company, comes up and funds bringing the, some of the Dead Sea Scrolls from Jerusalem to Davis. So they've, been, they've never been out of Jerusalem before except to Paris, number two, Davis. Secrecy? You couldn't believe what we had to go through. But they came to Davis, and again, this is another example. I didn't know the Dead Sea Scrolls from what I'd read in uh, Wikipedia, but something like that. This is completely known to me. But these wonderful pieces came. Some of them are very old. This is a scrap of Isaiah. So anyway, I'm sitting there. We're analyzing it. And again, you realize my role is that as a super technician. The experts are the people we're working with. So Megan Broach says to me, well, what does it look like? What do you think it looks like? Parchment. <laughs> it looks like a very crude parchment. Is there anything unusual about it? I said, it's very high in bromine. It's all excited. Bromine, bromine. And bromine comes from cars. It's a pollutant. He says, you know what they mine in the Dead Sea? Bromine. The sea has been there for so long that the chlorine-bromine ratio has modified it till it's very bromine rich. And the number was exactly that of the Dead Sea. These things have been actually cured in 
Dead Sea brines. Halfway through these things, suddenly the cure was Mediterranean brines. An ink, which was a kosher black ink, went to, in fact, an Egyptian metallic-based ink. There had been a major change in the Essene community about that time. So the regulations on one side and the other side had to be drawn a line to the middle. So Megan Broshi went back, delighted. And of course, we found out the problem was <laughs> bat guano. These caves have been, these things have been stored in a bat cave, and the bat guano made it extraordinarily basic. And of course, Jerusalem had, had pollution, which was acidic. And so the bat guano, the, so the basic things interacting with the pollution and were turning brown. And the answer was obvious you put them in inert storage. So Mrs. Bechtel then paid for the inert storage for all the parchment uh, parts of the Dead Sea Scrolls. But as I said, this is fun work. <laughs> they call this work. And then we start unfinished business. Life is getting a bit dicey. My best technician and scientist, Dr. Crisco, had been hired away by Paris. Uh, and we started this project called the Incanabula Project, analyzing various pieces of documents. Now, I have to apologize for the next slide. Oh, by the way, we were able to get a few pages of the B-42 and a few of the world's rarest book, the 36 line Bible, which Jenny had mentioned earlier. My apologies. We plot the data with the amount of metal in the inks on this axis versus the type of metals here, we started analyzing a variety of documents. By now, we had an open sesame to the Mines Museum. We're getting the most wonderful things that have been sent to Davis under good security and so on. And that's what it looked like. Now, if we start looking at the metal rich inks, they're there. These are inks very high in metal, and you can tell by the amount of metal to calcium ratio. These are the normal ink is way down here someplace. These are metal rich inks. And the problem is, that's what we find. So we look at the ratio of copper to lead here and the amount of metal and plot them. Now, this represents the inks of the Ohini Bible. Lots of metal and a copper lead ratio of about one. But let's look earlier. This is a very old piece of thing, which has been mentioned, it's called a Sevilla book fragment. It's a flyer, it's a quarto book with all kinds of prophecies. You know, and so this was obviously very early document, very crudely done, but it had the type base, I believe. Later, these are Latin texts, denotices, and they're better. And then finally we have over here, 42 line Bible. So you see a trajectory from high lead down to higher copper. And if you go ahead and look at the 36 line Bible, that's where it sits. It's clearly, shall I say, a Gutenbergian ink. Whether it's Gutenberg or not, I don't know. But the point was the ink certainly has a kind of thing. Now, <laughs> Gutenberg left the project, but the project wasn't quite finished. And they had to, because of the press runs, go back and reprint a few leaves uh, to make it up. And this is the ink they printed it in, way down here. It's a carbon-based standard brown ink. So clearly something had happened. When Gutenberg left, he appears to have taken his recipe with him. So the question is, what else did Gutenberg print? Likely this one? Before P42? Not. Mm, possible. He fetched the wisdom afterwards. Certainly the last part, the 36-line Bible, used the 42-line Bible as a, what do you call it, a type of puppy text. And so it's all kinds of mistakes propagated and so on. What sort of games are being played with the indulgences? These are the local cash cow. <laughs> it's not a great moment in the life of the Catholic Church. They'd have indulgences could be printed and then signed off. And these things sold like hotcakes. And some indulgences were coming in the 42 line text, some in the 36 in a different city. Was Gutenberg moonlighting? Something was going on with these things. We don't know what the deal is. And finally, where did he go with his ink recipe? Anyway, the point was, this represents then, we can't claim it was, it was designed and so on. It was really luck and people admiring others' expertise and working together. It didn't help at all, didn't harm at all, that it turns out that Adrian Wilson got a MacArthur Genius, Genius Fellowship and assigned us $15,000 a year for five years for the project. Uh, Dick Schwab got a Guggenheim and so on. Um, Cusco got three fellowships, believe it or not. 
so the point was it was a uh, so these are the things we did um, and right now the entire files are here at the Pius XII library they're being inventoried and so on and especially in the period the work stopped before it was finished it's a real shame um, the air quality work that gets paid <laughs> and we've been doing all kinds of work on uh, the National Network uh, San Joaquin Valley World Trade Center and so on we run the um, only aerosol station around the year on the Greenland ice cap. Um, and in the course of doing so, our technology has gotten a lot better. We have a whiz bang system. I was going to tell you flat out, it's the best in the world. Nobody can come close to us and analyze. That's why we're the only people analyzing on the ice cap. So we have a wonderful capability for historical analysis, but we don't do analysis at Davis. It's just not done. We have one part time lecturer in medieval studies. How many faculty here at St. Louis work in medieval studies? A lot. So the point was we have a wonderful tool and we're out of mice. But chat lives on. <laughs> the, uh, we helped set up an accelerator in um, the Louvre. In fact, under the Louvre. This is the rebuild of the Louvre that happened rather recently. The pyramid's going to be over here. And you've often wondered, those of you who follow the Da Vinci Code. <laughs> what was under that pyramid, right? It's a nuclear accelerator <laughs> with Dr. Bruce Cusco analyzing ancient documents. Like that. Now, most of the work they do is on paintings uh, because, in fact, it's, it's, it's what they're big in, but they do sciences and so on. I was invited for the 20th anniversary celebration of this last January. And in a room that would hold about this many people, and it was full of people all over Europe using the accelerator in the Louvre to analyze wonderful old documents, Merovingian jewelry, obsidian, rocks, things like that. These are young people doing great work. We could not have had such a big United States. We were the leaders at one point, and unfortunately now we're simply following in their footsteps. It kind of hurts me slightly. But here at St. Louis University, I see a, a lively intellectual ferment in this area. If we can help you in any way, we're just more than delighted to do so. So finally, I want to thank you all, Ginny, for that wonderful page. <laughs>